And now welcome to this week's edition of Where Did the Road Go? Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? I am your host, Soraya. And uh, tonight we are going to welcome back Randall Carlson. And uh, I'm not even sure exactly what we're going to be talking about tonight, but we're going we're gonna to find out as we go. You with us, Randall? I'm here. I'm with you, Soraya. All right. Now, you are a part of Sacred Geometry International. Yes. Now you, I, I'll have to admit to it. <laughs> and uh, we had you on back, I think, around May and stuff, and we talked about uh, catastrophes and uh, the end of the last ice age and such. And uh, you've been extremely busy over the last in, in the intervening months, haven't you? Yes, I have. And then, what have you been up to? Well, you know, I have a I have a design build company, and um, uh, it just things i started getting the calls for projects probably right around the time that we last interviewed and um after being you know pretty much in the horse latitude stuck in the horse latitudes for a few years uh it's like i've gotten such a rush of calls for for potential projects that i've almost been overwhelmed mm. um which is a good thing um it's kind of taken me a little, somewhat away from my research and one of my best friends and colleagues is right now actually out um, in British Columbia doing some research without me um, that that kind of ties into some of the things we were talking about uh, on our last interview. Um, but I've been back here uh, basically designing projects, and we've got three projects underway right now. So that's the, I haven't had three projects going for, I guess, since about 2010. So kind of making up for some lost momentum here and trying to get enough resources back to get back out on the road and do some more traveling and some more research. But I've been doing a lot of writing. Uh, you know, I, I, I never stopped doing the research because I'm sort of um, obsessed with that. So, you know, even though uh, I don't get quite as much time to do it, I am still spend pretty much every day, you know, good an hour or a couple hours every day doing research, writing, um, putting together um these multimedia shows. I have been working, um, in fact, with the same colleague of mine, Brad Young, that's out uh, doing the research right now. He and I and a, um, a videographer who is moonlighting from CNN have been putting together a, a 10-minute trailer about the um, well, the catastrophist research that, that you and I talked about last May hmm. uh, to try to get, uh, you know, looking for some funding to try to get that story out there because it's a a story that's only have, has been told so far in bits and pieces, and I don't think anybody has really put together the big picture yet. And so that's one of our objectives: is to try to show that there's a series of events that that around the planet that that actually are linked; that they're not separate events like orthodoxy uh, interprets them, but are actually part of a much larger scale planetary event. So I've been involved with that. Um, and then, of course, the work that I'm doing with Cameron through Sacred Geometry International, um, we have been doing this online course in Sacred Geometry. And um, we do, you know, we've done, I think we've, we're up to nine classes now that we've put together. And they're actually <clears throat> taking people through the, the basic geometry exercises. We're just, we're doing what we're calling level one right now, kind of initiation into the techniques and processes and philosophy of Sacred Geometry. And we're basically taking people through the the students through uh, the drawing exercises, kind of in the in the classical mode of the Pythagorean Academy or the, the Pythagorean Lodges or the Platonic Academy. And so we're we have an overhead camera, and we basically just film me drawing and talking about how we do the drawings, what the drawings mean, and um, we're just putting the the finishing touches on the, the classes for the uh, for the level one. Um, so that that's been a, a, a something that's occupied our time, and because of the way my business has gone, I didn't have quite as much time to work on that as I had uh, I hoped. Um, so far, we've gotten real good feedback. I think people are actually learning, um, you know, about the, the principles of sacred geometry, and you know how to actually. My approach to to this course is to actually try to teach people who want to not only just understand the, the, the philosophy and the meaning of it, but also put it to work. So it's kind of oriented towards builders, architects, designers, people who are into crafts, 
um, musicians, anybody who actually is out there creating things in the world that might find that sacred geometry is a useful tool to have at their disposal as they're um, trying to develop new forms and, and uh, idioms of expression. So um, it's I'm calling it kind of a, a practical hands-on course. So that's my orientation to it. And we're, like I said, about to finish up the level one classes, and then we're going to start um, putting together the level two classes. And we've got some, some new interesting things we're going to do um, for the for the level two classes that we're working on um, animations and things like that that I think really take the, the study of sacred geometry to a dynamic new level. Yeah, for people who are again, you know, it's like when things cut loose. You know, when we started this, I was working you know fifteen hours a week, twenty hours a week with my business, and now it suddenly mushroomed into you know fifty to sixty hours a week. So wow. it's really cut into the time that we were. Which is a good thing, um, right. but that's just the way it goes, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, for people who aren't familiar, who maybe didn't hear the first interview, can you explain a little about what sacred geometry is? Well, it, it's the study of, I, I think of it as the study of the, of the invisible architecture of creation, because geometry pervades all levels of creation, from, from living things to non-living things, from the cosmic level down to the molecular and atomic level. Um, and ver cultures throughout the ages have understood sacred geometry on, from different perspectives, but if you look at it uh, in the historical context, it was mostly the province of uh, builders and artists throughout the ages. You know, when you study the, the great sacred architecture of the world, one of the, the, the fundamental components of, of understanding the, the great structures, the, the temples, the cathedrals, um, the stone circles, all of these things, is the uh, the element of geometry, um, and it seems to be one of the common features of all of these things. When you look at you know the, the more well known ones, Stonehenge or the Great Pyramid of, of Khufu or you know Angkor Wat or or you know the the, the temples of uh, in uh, you know, pre Columbian Mesoamerica, um, you know the list goes on and on. The Sumerian ziggurats. What you find in all of these is that there was a common type of a geometry. Even though the outer expression may be very unique and different, um, nonetheless underlying it is a, you might say, is an invisible grid or matrix upon which the three-dimensional design was developed. Okay, so it, it, it has that aspect, that dimension of it in the, in the created environment, the built environment. It was also utilized by Renaissance artists to develop a compositional matrix upon which some of the great masterpieces uh, were developed. But, of course, it was also something that's intrinsic to nature. It's not really so much an invention of man as it is a discovery that, you know, nature is unified by all of these, by these geometric principles. And so what it is, it's, it's a, at least my approach to it is a study of, of you know, learning the methodology in the same way that it was taught you know, in the in the ancient world, and in the history of geometry, of course, probably the most salient culture is 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 Greece. You know, because we have you know uh, <clears throat> preeminent names like Pythagoras and Plato and Euclid and Thales and Archimedes and those guys who were you know masters of geometry in those days. And in the Platonic academies, there was a specific way of teaching it, like in uh, you know the as you know. It may be apocryphal, but it's always said that over the entrance to Plato's Academy, it said, let none enter here who are ignorant of, ignorant of geometry. Hmm. And the idea is that geometry pervades every aspect of the living and non-living worlds. And <clears throat> by utilizing these principles of geometry, we can um, sort of, uh, and we can, we can, the built environment becomes much more of an expression of, of natural forms. Um, in the sense that there are these proportions and ratios that sort of express harmony. And in, within the, the definitions of sacred geometry, harmony is basically the idea that there's this relationship, this proportional relationship between the parts of any composition and the whole composition. And so there becomes a resonance between the whole and the part because of these unique geometrical proportions that are manifest. And so what we do is, at least in the course that I teach, is we, we learn about these, you know, 
the square root of 2, the square root of 3, uh, the golden section, very important one, which is, which is a derivative of the square root of 5. And this brings in a realm that has been called by some researchers dynamic symmetry. And dynamic symmetry is the idea, again, that there is this special relationship between the part and the whole. And that's uh, presumably and philosophically is the key to harmony. And so, you know, what I'm trying to do is resurrect and recover some of these principles. So I've, you know, assembled a library of mostly everything that is now extant regarding the subject. Um, and there's always new material and new things coming out um, over the years compared to, like, when I first began these studies in the early 1970s. But um, what I'm trying to do is to synthesize, you know, basically what we now know about this subject and, and what we're learning about it. And the, the thing that I've noticed as I, as I learn more about it <clears throat> and as more research is done is that the definition of what it is is constantly evolving. Whereas, like, the first works that I ever consulted, that, that I earliest references that I could use uh, or could find in my research uh, that utilized the term sacred geometry was specifically in reference to medieval ecclesiastical architecture. You know, basically Christian abbeys and cathedrals. Well, it became apparent, you know, which was from from works written in the 1940s and 1950s. Well, it became apparent that, um, you know, subsequently the the the, um, the idea of it expanded to include many more um, uh, manifestations of this particular subject matter than just medieval Christian ecclesiastical architecture. Um, you know, then you, you had the work, you know, in the 1960s of Alexander Thom that, that um, you know, studied the geometry of all of the stone circles, megalithic structures in, in Britain. Um, you know, you had the work of John Michel, you had the work of Keith Critchlow, who uh, did extensive studies into the geometry of Islamic art and architecture. Um, and what these individual researchers are doing by, by, by looking at these various areas is showing that there is this common system that seems to link them all together. And um, so th that's kind of what it is. It's, it's, it's that there is this matrix of, of proportion, of form, that seems to unite both the living and the non-living world in this symphony of architecture, or, or symphony of geometry. And, you know, what I try to do is I find that by doing the hands-on, the drawings, is a very powerful way of learning this because you're coordinating hand mind and eye, all in this process of trying to do these drawings and understand the principles and the relations intrinsic to these, these patterns that are unfolding on the, the drawing, uh, the sketch pad that you're working on. In level three that we're planning, you know, we will then go from the two-dimensional into the three-dimensional structures. But to really fully understand what's going on in the three-dimensional relationships where we start studying the platonic solids and the semi-regular Archimedean solids, as they're called, you know, you, to really appreciate what's going on there, you have to have the fundamental understanding of these relationships in the two dimensions. So it's, uh, I guess, uh, being, you know, in my long convoluted way here, I'm trying to say that there, there, I've never really found what a definition of sacred geometry is. I say, well, I can try to define it for you, but let me just take you through the experience of it so you do the drawings and you'll see what it is you'll experience mm. what it is um but if i was going to try to put a definition on it i would say it's the the invisible architecture of creation and through the study of the system the what is invisible gradually reveals itself and becomes visible to the trained eye now now numbers in in general tend to be you know like measurements and stuff tend to be kind of arbitrary um so how does that fit in with with uh, <clears throat> sacred geometry? Ah, well, that's a very good question, Soraya, because what you begin to find out when you study sacred geometry is that the numbers and the measurements are not arbitrary. And in fact, that's one of the things that I do <clears throat> and will be doing in level two is demonstrating how measurements from the ancient world are unified according to the same system. And a simple explanation would be, uh, or a simple example would be, going back to, to ancient Egypt, like into Old Kingdom times, there were two units of measurement that were used quite frequently in Egyptian temple architecture. One was called the Riemann, and one was called the Royal Cubit. 
The Riemann was just a little over 14 inches. It was actually, for the listeners who might want to write this down, <clears throat> it was 1.2165 feet. 1.2165 feet. And um, that's based upon, uh, you know, actual detailed measurements of extant examples of the Riemann. There would actually be... Um, the Riemann might be inscribed on a on a temple. It might there might be an actual bar that has the length of the Riemann, um, and then the second unit of measurement that was used quite frequently was called the Royal Cubit, and the Royal Cubit was about twenty point six two six five inches. Well, there's a relationship between the Rome Riemann and Royal Cubit, and it's this: if you draw one square Riemann on a side, in other words, draw a square a little over fourteen inches, I'll say one point two one six five feet. Um, on the side, the diagonal of that square <clears throat> will be twenty. Uh, will be the, will be the royal cubit. See, so so what happens is is that they are related geometrically, and this is not an accident. Now, what happens is if you take any square whose side length is one unit, its diagonal is going to be that unit times the square root of two. Now, the square root of two is an irrational number. It doesn't repeat. It doesn't terminate. It's like pi. You know, it, it goes on forever. And so you can express a Riemann as a, you know, a number of Riemanns as a whole number uh, on a square, but its side will then be, any, uh, its diagonal will then be an irrational number. Or you can express its diagonal in integral num uh, terms, and then its side will be irrational. You can only express one or the other as as a whole number, and the other one's going to be an irrational. However, when you take a square Riemann and a square royal cubit, they're completely and totally commensurable because one square royal cubit is exactly two square Riemanns in area. So there's so there's this geometric relationship between the two that's based upon this fundamental um, irrational uh, number, the square root of two. <coughs> now. <coughs> Excuse me there. Um, the, it goes further than that. See, <clears throat> now if you take a cube, there's one, one royal, I mean, it's one Riemann cubic. So you've got a cube. If you can picture a cube, not a square, but a three-dimensional cube, it's the same length on all three sides in three dimensions, and it's that one Riemann. Okay, you draw the diagonal on the face of the cube, that's going to be a royal cubit. Now you draw the diagonal, or you insert the diagonal of the whole cube. So you go from one corner to the opposite corner, um, if you can visualize that, the diagonal of the cube. That becomes another unit of measure that was used in the ancient world and is the unit of measurement that's sometimes called the uh, cubit of Ezekiel, that he describes his vision of the temple. And the <clears throat> cubit of Ezekiel is the square root of three times the Riemann. And so <clears throat> in this one figure of the, of the cube, one cubic Riemann, you have these three units of ancient measure that are integrated by this one common geometry. And it's likely that the cubit that was used in the building of King Solomon's temple was also Ezekiel's cubit. So if you put the, uh, the, uh, the Riemann of 1.2165 times the square root of 3, that gives you the length of this is Ezekiel's cubit, which was <clears throat> actually, if, if the listeners want to do this, typically your, your, the standard cubit is the length of the distance from your elbow to your fingertips. And then Ezekiel's cubit was the uh, standard cubit plus a hand's breadth. <clears throat> so you, you place your cubit, like just on any desktop, lay down your forearm, the distance from elbow to fingertip represents a cubit, put your, like if this is your right hand, then take your left hand, and right at your, at your longest finger, place the knuckles of your four fingers uh, right there, and that becomes a cubit and a hand's breadth, and that would be Ezekiel's cubit. <clears throat> and that bears the, the geometrical relationship to the Riemann as the square root of three to one. Then it goes further than that. Then the Romans had a unit of measurement called the pace, and that was double the Riemann. And then what this Alexander Thom, who measured the, um, the over 500 megalithic stone circles and structures in the ancient British uh, Isles, he derived a unit of measurement he called the megalithic yard, which was right at 2.72 feet. Well, it turns out that the, the Riemann times the square root of 5 gives you the megalithic 
yard. The square root, uh, or the, the Riemann times the square root of six basically gives us within a very, very tiny fraction our modern-day yard. So what I'm getting at here with this is that you can begin to get into this study and you realize that the, that the units of measurement used throughout the ancient world seemed to have been integrated or synthesized into a common system and linked by this dynamic geometry. And this is, I made, I used the reference earlier of dynamic symmetry, um, which is essentially based upon these geometric relationships of one square root of two, square root of three, square root of four, square root of five, square root of six, and, and so forth. These are the units of measurements that were used to build the sacred structures around the world. And we find the same system of units of measurement used to lay out the great monumental earthwork structures of North America. They were being used in um, pre-Columbian Mesoamerica. Uh, from what we can uh, ascertain, they were being used in Babylonia and in Assyria and who knows where else. This is something that in the um, second level of this sacred geometry course that we're going to do, we're going to teach what I call it, it's the master diagram that basically synthesizes all of these ancient sacred units of measurement that were used in the ancient world into one coherent pattern so that you can see instantly the relationships of one to another and um i don't think as far as i know nobody's ever done that before but it's it it basically demonstrates that that there's a geometrical connection between all these units of measurement and then further <clears throat> the um the units of measurement are derived from the synthesis of two things, the, the human form, the human dimension, like we just talked about the cubit, mm -hmm. well, elbow to fingertip. We already know where the foot comes from. It's a standardization of a male foot. Well, when we look in the, the ancient world, we discover, you know, in ancient Greece, in, in ancient Assyria, many other cultures, there was actually two feet that were used, one slightly longer than the other because one was derivative of a male foot and the other was derivative of a female foot. So if you had a temple that was built to a goddess, for example, it was probably the shorter foot that was derived of a standardized derivation from a, the female foot. Hmm. Um, so, uh, and then the other, the other source for unifying these systems or these units of measurement was geodetic. That is based upon the earth itself. And here it gets really kind of more complicated than we could probably explain coherently without using the graphics and, and the illustrations right. that I, that I would use in my courses. But essentially, you know, the earth is an oblate spheroid. So what that means is that the earth's dimensions change depending where you are on the earth's surface. So, you know, uh, units of latitude and late units of longitude are going to change as you move around on the surface of the Earth. And what you can discover when you look at these is that oftentimes, um, for example, uh, Chart Cathedral is a good example. Um, the Parthenon is another good example of two structures that were built consistent with units of measurement derived from their places on the surface of the Earth. In other words, if you take a, a, a minute of latitude or longitude, divide that into seconds of latitude or longitude, and that's further subdivided, say, like a hundredth of a second of latitude, you can find like Parthenon, for example, exactly represents a, a, a derivative of its position in Athens. Hmm. Uh, so this was the other aspect of this. Well, you know, the metric system was ultimately based upon the Earth, um, the size of the Earth, a hundred thousandth the distance from the um, equator to the pole. But <clears throat> the the problem was it bore no relation to the human proportion. Mm. Whereas, like, when the imperial system that we use of feet, inches, and miles are all based upon the human form. Um, you know, the inch is basically you, you, the width of the thumb or the, the width of the digit, uh, just as the cubit is the distance elbow to fingertip. The mile was traditionally 1,000 human paces. So the Roman mile, uh, you know, was a thousand paces reaching out from the center of, of Rome. Um, the British mile was longer, and our modern mile of 5,280 feet is very ancient. Um, in fact, it's likely that uh, a subdivision of our modern mile, uh, like one-fifth of a mile, is 1,056 feet. So one-tenth of that, defines the outer limits of the sarsen stone circle at Stonehenge. So in other words, if you take the, the, the outer circle of, of Stonehenge, 
which is 105.6 feet times 50, you get exactly a mile. So most people aren't aware of that, but the that the that the outer stone faces of Stonehenge is one fiftieth of our modern day imperial mile. Hmm. Again, I don't think that's coincidental. I think it's because we have inherit in terms of the mile, we've inherited a unit of measure that's at least four thousand years old. Now, wh- we're still using. Wh- where did they get this from? I mean, if it's spread across the entire mm-hmm. world, does this come from a previous civilization, perhaps? <clears throat> well, that would be my, my first suspicion. You know, there are stories and legends about the origin of this. When you, you know, the, the Greek stories and legends are consistent with the Egyptian, which are consistent with the, with the Mayan, which are consistent with the, the Babylonian, and they always basically say the same thing. This, this stuff along agriculture and architecture and these various subjects were taught to humans by the gods, whatever that means. You know, Isis taught the system of metrology and architecture and agriculture to the to the forerunners of the ancient Egyptians, for example. So what exactly does that mean? Um, you know, in the context of what we were talking about in May, you know, I tried to, to lay out the groundwork for people to understand that, you know, human history on planet Earth is a much deeper, longer subject than, than our historical records would lead us to believe. You know, we are, are basically our written history in round numbers is 5,000 years old. We trace back the origins of agriculture, domestication of an, a, uh, animals, the dispersion of languages, the, the building of the first cities, all essentially to eight or 10,000 years ago. Well, in the context of our last conversation, I tried to present the, the, the overwhelming evidence that, you know, between 10 and 13,000 years ago, there was a series of global catastrophes that essentially erased whatever was here before that. And when you realize that the human species, modern human species, with presumably the same intellectual capabilities as, as, as we modern humans, have been inhabiting this planet for conservatively 150 to 200,000 years, you realize there's probably a lot more to the human story on planet Earth than conventional academia has recognized based on the written historical record. And, and of course, it's easy to make the assumption that, you know, nothing much was going on 15 or 20 or 30,000 years ago because of the lack of, of records. Well, it's only when you begin to understand how extreme and how comprehensive some of these catastrophic remodelings of the Earth have been that we can appreciate that there's that really it would be surprising if much from these former ages even existed at all. Because, <clears throat> see, one of the things that becomes clear from the study of the rise and fall of human civilization is that these cultures that we build, these civilizations that we've created throughout history, are actually pretty fragile things. And, and these natural shifts in climate that have occurred long before we were driving SUVs and burning fossil fuels have, have, have had drastic effects on, on you know the stability of human civilizations, there have been multiple dark ages just within the last five thousand years, and and we can see from studies of climate and environmental change that you know the the, the changes that have that have now been documented to have occurred within the last five to six thousand years, in some cases have been pretty extreme compared to what we've experienced within the last few centuries, but have actually been quite mild compared to some of the changes that we've documented to have occurred over the last hundred thousand years for example i mean if we were to if the 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 environment were to shift and we were to go into a a full glacial full-on ice age mode as happened you know between 26 and 28 thousand years ago we could essentially kiss our modern civilization goodbye if we had the kind of global warming that we saw at the end of the last ice age, and we're talking 15 to 17 degrees Fahrenheit average in many regions of the world, which is utterly dwarfs what we've seen over the last century. Again, we could we could kiss our civilization goodbye. Um, you know, we're, we're we're talking, we're making projections about a sea level rise of one to four feet in the next century, and looking at that as, uh, as, as being a very difficult thing to adapt to. Well, at the end of the last ice age, the sea level rose 400 feet. You know, let's try to imagine what a rise or a fall of 400 feet in sea level would do. Um, it would be 
pretty drastic in its ramifications. And what I'm getting at here is when we begin to appreciate how extreme some of these changes have been, we can begin to also understand why previous cultural um, events or pre- previous cultural developments that had taken place may not leave much of a trace. Because, you know, in some of the, the geological documentation I've been doing, I mean, literally, you can stand there and, and look at a, at, a, at a canyon that may have been gouged out and you've lost a thousand feet of bedrock in a matter of a few weeks. You know, I mean, there were floods that were, you know, thousands of feet deep sweeping across the land. And after these floods had passed, there was essentially nothing left of whatever had been there before. And when you consider that these floods <clears throat> at the end of the last ice age, mostly concentrated along river valleys, for example, there's scarcely a river valley on the planet that does not display evidence of extremely augmented flows uh, during these transitions from glacial to interglacial ages. Well, when you appreciate the fact that most human cultures uh, usually uh, begin to emerge and germinate along river valleys and along coastlines, at the mouths of rivers, you know, the great cities basically showed up along rivers always. Tigris-Euphrates River, the Nile River, um, etc., the Indus River. Well, then when you realize that these rivers all show evidence of having these extraordinary floods, where, like take our own Mississippi River, uh, for example, there were uh, periods of time where the peak discharges flowing down the river, Mississippi River were hundreds of times greater than any modern known documented flood. You know, the largest flood in recent times in the Mississippi was just over a million cubic feet per second. Um, which was back that big flood in 93 that caused so much economic havoc in the Midwest. Right. Well, the, the peak flow of that was minuscule compared to the flows of, uh, you know, at the terminal, uh, at this transition out of the Ice Age. And when you realize that basically every river that you can look at displays the same kind of evidence, if there had been towns, villages, communities, they would have been utterly swept away. Um cities, communities on the coastlines, well, you know, they're under 400 feet of water now. So what I'm getting at here is that once you begin to realize how extremely the environment has changed during the tenure of humanity on this planet, you can begin to realize that, you know, it's very possible we have built who knows how many, you know, levels of culture that have been basically erased and leave no trace, other than their legends through legends and folklore and tales and so on. And of course, every ancient culture is consistent on that of talking about a former order of things, whether we call it the Garden of Eden or Hyperborea or Atlantis or, you know, numerous other names. You know, this is one consistent tradition that we find from all over the world that this belief in a former order of, of things that basically succumbed to these great changes. And uh, speaking of Atlantis, uh, there was a new story, I think it came out this week, about this uh, pyramid off the, the coast of the Azores, and it's supposedly yeah. 40 meters down and thought to be approximately 60 meters tall, has a base around 8,000 square meters. And this is, I mean, that's wow. pretty far underwater. Yeah, what did you say, 40 meters, 40 right? 40 meters, so- yeah. Uh huh. So forty meters. That's you know, uh, what is that? That's about um, oh, that comes out to be about one hundred and thirty feet, I think. <clears throat> so yeah, that's pretty far down. So you can see, you know, basically sea levels would not have been low enough to build a, uh, a pyramid. Now that forty meters is that the the tip of the pyramid or the base of the pyramid? Do you know right uh, offhand? What it says is that the discovery of the large man-made pyramid located at a depth of approximately forty meters. That's all. It okay, says. so we don't know though whether that's. Yeah. I guess I'm going to presume that's the base of the. I pyramid. would think so. But in any case, yeah, in any case, we're talking about something that has to go back to to ice age. You know, that has to be Paleolithic in age. Right. In other words, because in order to get back to when sea level was low enough to build a pyramid there, we have to go back at least eight or 10,000 years. However, <clears throat> at eight or 10,000 years ago, sea level was still rising from the melting ice. So it's not likely that somebody would have built a pyramid so close to the rising sea levels that it would have been soon drowned. So I'm guessing 
that if this proves to be authentic, that that pyramid had to have preceded the beginning of sea level rise, mm. which dates to about 13,000 years ago. So in other words, I would surmise that that pyramid had to have been there, had to be older than 13,000 years, which is basically the inception of the the, the catastrophic sea level rise events that, that terminated the last ice age, which of course, you know, would have been a consequence of the these huge, massive ice sheets covering you know, the continental North America and Northwestern Europe melting and that meltwater flowing back into the oceans. So, you know, it's likely that that um, pyramid is older than 13,000 years. Now, it's interesting that it was found at the Azores because I've been saying for years and years and years that if you go back to the original accounts of Plato, and which, which is basically about 98% of our information on Atlantis comes from the two dialogues of Plato, uh, Timaeus and Critias. And um, most everything that has been written, and there's been thousands of works written on Atlantis, are ultimately derivative from Plato's original account. So what I do is I recommend to people, go back to Plato's original account and take the details of what Plato says. And there's been <clears throat> so many uh, proposed uh, locations for Atlantis, and every single one of them has to deviate in one respect or another from, you know, Plato's pristine account and the details that he provides there. Um, but it's clear from his account that, you know, it would have been in the Atlantic Ocean and nowhere else. It's clear from his account, and this is confirmed by going back to the original Greek languages he used, too, um, that, you know, it was outside the Pillars of Heracles, which puts it, you know, outside the Straits of Gibraltar into the Atlantic Ocean and not in the Mediterranean. And, you know, he specifically gives the date at least three times in the dialogue, which is 9,000 years prior to Solon's exile in Egypt, which occurred at about, um, you know, 600 B.C. So if, it, if, if the, the demise of Atlantis occurred 9,000 years before Solon's trip to Egypt, um, that places the demise of Atlantis, the subsidence of Atlantis, as Plato describes it, at 11,600 years ago, which has been generally dismissed by a lot of modern researchers um, who, who try to take a more conventional approach to it. Yet, it's interesting that that date coincides exactly with what's known as the Younger Dryas Primordial Transition by paleoclimatologists. And this is one of the great climate warmings that terminated the Ice Age right at 11,600 years ago and caused a consequent as a consequence, a very rapid catastrophic rise of sea level. And, you know, if you um, look at, if you understand geophysics at all, or geology, you understand the concept of isostasy, which is basically a vertical redistribution of mass throughout the, the, the Earth's crust. And so, when you pile up, say, a two-mile thick ice sheet over the North American continent, which was its thickest over Hudson Bay, what happens is the weight of that ice compresses the, the crust of the Earth. In the case of um, North America, there are regions that were compressed through um, what would be, we would call an isostatic depression by as much as 2,000 feet. Now, when you remove that weight, the, the land begins to rebound. And if you look um, at aerial photographs of the shorelines around Hudson Bay, you see that there are multiple shorelines elevated many hundreds of feet above modern sea level and that's due to the rebounding the isostatic rebound of north of the north american crust after the release of this tremendous load of ice well when the ice melted that load was released from the land and it was essentially dumped back in the ocean basins now you look at the Azores, and essentially what you have what you have in the in the form of the Azores is they're the peak of mountains that are part of what's called the Azores Plateau. And the Azores Plateau is flanked uh, is essentially uh, cut almost right through the middle by the um, the Mid Atlantic Ridge, which is where the the European plate, the African plate, and the North American tectonic plates come together. Right, and the Azores Plateau itself is actually um, rocks that made up of, of bedrock that was once part of the African plate, but in the process of seafloor spreading, it got left behind. Well, <clears throat> what you have now again with the, the Azores is a series of islands that are basically the peaks of mountains. Right, 
Well, if you drop sea level 400 feet, you're, you're basically doubling the size of all those islands. Now, if you take into account isostatic compensation and you realize that the mid-Atlantic ridge, that, that suture that runs right down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, is one of the, the, the most weakest and susceptible places for crustal um, repositioning on the, on the planet, you realize that along there, there would probably be a concentration of, of isostatic effects. And, and the geology supports the fact that there was a massive subsidence along the mid-Atlantic Ridge as a consequence of the rapidly rising sea level. And that subsidence may have been as much as 1,000 to 2,000 feet, and maybe even more in places. And it's clear from the studies around the Azores that there was a focus of subsidence right along the, the, the uh, Azores Plateau. Well, when you combine uh, uh, the sea level dropping by several thousand feet and sea level, the sea floor dropping by several thousand feet and sea level rising by 400 feet, what you have there is during the Ice Age, the a lot, large portions of the Azores Plateau would have been above sea level. Mm. And then when you go into the studies of the, um, the Gulf Stream, you realize that during the Ice Age, the Gulf Stream shifted south about 500 miles further south than it now does, and it basically would have uh, circumambulated right around the Azores Plateau, the emerged, not submerged, but emerged uh, Azores Plateau. So if, if taking this in context, and of course, and I'm abbreviating this discussion sure, immensely, sure. Um, if you were living, if you were, you know, living on planet Earth during the Ice Age, probably one of the most benign places to have lived would have been on those mid-Atlantic islands. And if there was a place where an advanced maritime culture, and I'm not talking now about, you know, anti-gravity or, or, you know, flying machines or any of that stuff, you know, I, you know, I'm not, who knows what they were up to, but, you know, Plato doesn't describe anything like that. If you look at what Plato describes, he describes an advanced maritime culture. And there's really nothing pseudoscientific about theorizing the existence of an advanced maritime culture on the mid-Atlantic islands during the Ice Age. Mm. And I think that what we're doing here is we're going back to Plato's original account, because in the 1960s and 1970s, with the advent of plate tectonics, a group of geologists and scholars got together to look at whether there was any veracity to Plato's account. And essentially what they, what they concluded was that well, Plato's geology, we know now, from what we know, there, there couldn't have been any massive island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean that sunk. And what they do is they kind of create this straw man, because what Plato is actually describing is a series of islands. In fact, the word that he uses repeatedly is, is the plural, the Greek plural word for islands. And I think what he's describing is an island complex perhaps something like Polynesia, uh, but some of the islands may have been pretty extensive, um, and they would have been an ideal place for uh, a culture to emerge. But what happened was, is with the advent of plate tectonics, there was a couple of works that came out that purported to show that the uh, Plato's account was inconsistent with what we knew about geology back, you know, in the, say, mid-1970s. Right. And <clears throat> if you look at Atlantean studies in the books written, most of the books written prior to the 1970s kind of go exactly with Plato's account and assume that we're talking about an, a mid-Atlantic location. Subsequent to several of these works, like one of them um, was uh, entitled um, Atlantis from the Geological... It was, it was a book called Atlantis, Fact or Fiction. Mm. And, <clears throat> and there was a preeminent geologist named Dorothy... Vitaliano, who, who wrote an article, Atlantis, from the geological point of view. And she basically concludes that it was geologically um, untenable. And therefore, any other kind of evidence that would have supported Plato's uh, account can be just dismissed without any further consideration. However, what has accumulated is scientific evidence in support of the idea that, yes, actually there was a major subsidence along the mid-Atlantic Ridge as a result of the inevitable isostatic compensation of the rapid sea level rise of 400 feet. 
and that large portions of the Azores Plateau probably were above water throughout the, cor- the, the Ice Age and would have been ideal places uh, for, for uh, an advanced maritime culture to evolve. And so what we then have to do is go back and, I think, and relook at Plato's account. So all of my work on Atlantis has been about, you know, basically let's get back to Plato and take a fresh look at his detailed account. And when you do that, and he gives considerable details, what we find is that it's totally consistent with an Azores location for Atlantis. So I've been basically teaching this in my lecture, giving lectures on this for at least 10 years now. So finding, hearing this about the pyramid being off the course, the coast of Toshira is pretty exciting stuff to me because it seems to confirm what I've suspected all along is that Plato's account has to be taken at, play, at face value. All right. Um, we got to take a quick 45-second uh, break. We'll be right back with Randall Carlson. The opinions expressed by the host and guests on Where Did the Road Go are their own and do not represent those of WVBR or its management. Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com where you can send us questions for our live guests via email or the live chat room. You can also check out our upcoming schedule, blog, link section, book reviews, videos, and links to our Twitter, Facebook, iTunes, and much more. That's wheredidtheroadgo.com. And tonight, tonight we've been talking with Randall Carlson about sacred geometry and uh, what would probably amount to the end of the world to the people living back in uh, 12,000 years ago. Now, one of the things you mentioned, you said the, the ice caps were the heaviest over uh, the Hudson Bay, and that's where the magnetic North Pole was. Do you think there was a, there was a pole shift involved as well? Um. Yeah, now that gets a little complicated as well. Um, you know, we, we can reference back to the work of, of uh, Charles Hapgood, who was the primary uh, expositor of, of pole shift theories. There was uh, Hugh Ock and Klaus Brown talked about pole shifts. Uh, Emmanuel Velikovsky talks about pole shifts. But um, Charles Hapgood probably did the most credible work on that, and he was the one who theorized a, a Hudson Bay location for... Um, uh, for the North Pole during the Ice Age. And I, I find that tenable. I don't think that a pole shift was responsible for the catastrophe. Uh, you know, I, I've kind of turned it around. I think that a pole shift was a consequence of a of this extraordinary mass redistribution uh, or redistribution of mass that took place over the Earth's surface as a result of the glacial unloading. Um, and, and it seems like and, that's and, that's the big problem with most pole shift theories. There's no um, nothing that sets it off until you've came up come up with this. Yeah, well, and, and see, uh, in my scenario, the pole shift is something that happened much more gradually and is actually still going on. Um, and, it, and it accelerated, you know, during the first oh, three to four or five thousand years of the Holocene, which is you know, roughly from 11,000 to about 6,000 years ago. Um, because essentially, you know, again, I mentioned earlier, the, the shape of the Earth is an oblate spheroid. So that means that right now when the Earth is spinning on its axis in equilibrium, the distance from the center of the Earth's uh, mass, the center of gravity, to its surface is 13 miles greater at the equator than it is at the pole, right? Well, what happens if, you know, over a geologically short time period of, you know, a few thousand years, suddenly a region of the Earth's surface is displaced vertically relative to the center of mass? Well, in the case of uh, the polar region, if the polar region was depressed thousands of feet by the ice load, then that ice load is released, the land rebounds several thousand feet, it's no longer going to be in equilibrium with its latitude. And so I suspect that what happens is that when the, when the land rebounds vertically and as it moves away from the Earth's center of gravity, it also has to shift latitudinally in order to find its equilibrium position. And that is what I believe being uh, a pole shift trigger. Again, the, the pole shift not being the cause of the catastrophe, but being the final uh, consequence of the catastrophe. Personally, I think the catastrophe was triggered by something extraterrestrial. I think that when it comes down 
by default, that's the only thing that really has the capabilities of of um, releasing the kinds of energies necessary to to cause that extreme of a shift. Now, you're, and that, you're, you're talking like a uh, comet asteroid type of extraterrestrial, correct? Yeah, yeah, yes. And when we turn to the astronomical domain, I think the evidence is clear now that you know the astronomical environment is subject to a high degree of variability. And there are periods of time where, you know, the astronomical environment is relatively calm and serene, and there are other times when it becomes extremely active. And I think ice age is the only way we can explain the onset of an ice age is by uh, basically referring to cosmic forces. Um, you know, uh, see, here, here's the problem with an ice age. Uh, you have a rapid accumulation and buildup of an extraordinary amount of ice. Well, what that requires is a very active hydrological system that has to precipitate out a snowfall. Like, for example, basically all of Canada during the last ice age was buried under this huge ice sheet, right? Um, and now, there, it's even though it gets very cold in Canada in the winter, the four months and the five months of warmth each year is enough to melt off the winter's accumulation of ice, or, or snow, rather. So it doesn't ever really accumulate and compress into glacial ice. Well, essentially, around 26 to 28,000 years ago, Canada apparently was forested and not that much different than now. And over a period of a few thousand years, you know, it was buried under an ice sheet. And then that ice sheet grew to be two miles thick over the next six to 8,000 years. Well, this is a very rapid accumulation and requires a lot of... Um, precipitation in the form of snowfall. So that precipitation, in turn, requires a, a very active hydrological system. Well, the thing is, is that to activate or energize the hydrological system, you need heat energy. In other words, you have to have heat energy to uh, evaporate the water out of the oceans that then transports poleward and precipitates out as snow, but then the poles have to be cold enough that that snow does not melt but accumulates into these massive ice sheets. And so there's this this, contra, this um, contradiction there that doesn't really make sense, because on the one hand, you're saying, well, the climate has to be cold to preserve the snow in the form of uh, glacial ice, but on the other hand, the rapid accumulation of ice requires heat. So this is a conundrum that has been addressed since the beginning of glacial studies in the mid-19th century and has not been resolved to this day. And I think that basically... What, what they have done is they've looked at terrestrial forces and forces of, um, of a more gradualistic nature, such as changes in, you know, solar radiation because of, uh, you know, changes, the, the, the distribution of solar energy to the Earth's surface varies over tens of thousands of years because of shifting orbital geometries, right? And for a long time, these shifting orbital geometries were considered to be the cause of the onset and determination of ice ages. The problem was, is as dating proxies became ever more precise, we realized that these shifts from glacial to interglacial happened way faster than these very slow changes in orbital geometries could account for. And, and so here comes the conundrum. Um, in the early 70s, it became apparent to researchers that the energies involved just to melt the ice at the end of the last ice age far exceeded any energy available on the surface of the earth today um, far exceeded it and and even even the amount of energy the of maximum amount of energy at at the um, earth's surface is at tropical oceans and were you to apply that much energy to the to the glaciated regions of the earth's surface it would still take five to ten times longer at minimum conservatively, than it actually took to get rid of the ice. And so the, this, this is what became known as the energy paradox. There wasn't enough energy available under normal circumstances to melt the ice as fast as it melted. Um, and again, so I, I say, have said for you know a quarter century now that the explanation, we will not find the solution to that conundrum by only looking at very slow, gradualistic astronomical effects or purely terrestrial effects. We have to look at catastrophic changes in the astronomical environment, which to me means the influx of, of cosmic material. Uh, asteroids, comets, can, can we're, as we're learning, can, can 
trigger uh, some very extreme and extraordinary environmental consequences, um, you know, by by any number of mechanisms. Uh, and, you know, we're only just really in our infancy of, of understanding this level of planetary geology, where we're beginning to appreciate the environmental effects of Earth's encounter with the denizens of the deep, the, 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 the inhabitants of space. You know, and there's we realize that the that these that the creatures that are out there are are widely varied in their in their makeup and their composition. You know, from from iron asteroids to carbonaceous asteroids to stony asteroids to comets and all of the volatiles that they uh, entrain, the dust that they entrain, the biological um, constituents. We're beginning to realize that all of these factors have played a major role in the great changes that have occurred down here below in, in the planetary environment. And, and I believe that, you know, as this thing plays out, we're going to come to realize that it's these cosmic changes and their effects on Earth that we're seeing reflected in these great sweeping environmental changes. And, you know, there's evidence emerging now that, yes, Earth did encounter some kind of a cosmic object or swarm of cosmic objects between 11 and 13,000 years ago. And one of the things that when I mentioned earlier about my colleague Brad Young, he's out right now in British Columbia collecting geomorphic evidence of what very possibly might have been an impact site. But see, here's the thing. You know, you can't look at conventional impact studies to get a handle on this because many of the skeptics, when, when this idea that there was a, a, a cosmic encounter 12 or 13,000 years ago was first proposed, oh, about 8 or 10 years ago, there was a lot of skepticism. And, and, and one of the, 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 the very typical comments that you hear is, well, if that happened, where's the crater? You know, where are the right. craters? We don't see any craters, right? Well, you know, craters are what you have when you have a, a, a solid asteroidal body, uh, you know, landing into, into the surface of the land, of the, of the ground. What happens if an asteroid or a piece of a comet impacts a mile or two mile thick ice sheet? See, it's going to be a totally different suite of geomorphic evidence you've got to look for. What happens when it falls into the ocean? Well, again, you know, you're not going to have your, your classic bowl-shaped crater form that you can then invoke and say, well, here's the evidence. But the, the, the absence of this classic crater form, bowl-shaped crater form, shows that there was no encounter. No, I, I don't accept that at all. And, and I've had several conversations with, with leading geologists around the world in the last year Particularly, I've targeted discussions with several who who would put themselves in the skeptical camp, and and what I've discovered is that they have not really considered what exactly the consequences would be. Say, of a what would happen if a if a half a mile chunk of a comet nucleus or an asteroid actually struck a, a mile thick or two mile thick ice sheet, and I think that you know if you actually look at the geomorphology of the region of the ice sheet. I think you can identify at least six or eight locations that I believe bear the geomorphic footprints of impacts onto the ice sheet. And my, my friend and colleague, Brad, is out right now collecting evidence um, that I believe supports that contention. Nice. All right, you're on WVBR. Yeah, you're on WVBR FM Ithaca, and uh, we're talking to Randall Carlson here on Where the Road Go. The last takes of the loss will be up next, but we're going to talk to Randall a little bit longer. I have a few more questions here I want to throw at you. Um, what, what do you make of the frozen mammoths in Siberia and such? Well, they're, that's a great question. And, you know, it's the frozen mammoths that actually first piqued my curiosity and interest that led me into some of these studies. Um, you know, reading Velikovsky and um, um, several other authors who, who mentioned these frozen mammoths, Hapgood and stuff, I mean, these studies of mine go back to the to the early 1970s, early to mid 1970s. That was something that I just really got my curiosity, and I I don't know what the explanation is, but I think the likely explanation would be something like this: that um, you know, basically, if you have a comet nucleus coming in and you know into the Earth's atmosphere at a high rate of speed, releasing uh, volatiles into the Earth's atmosphere, and some of these volatiles may be uh, have a temperature, you know, of, of a couple of hundred degrees below zero, um, that could be part of what the explanation is. Um, because, like, clearly in the case of the Barasovka mammoth, you had a six-ton mammoth that still had undigested food in its stomach. 
well, you know, Clarence Birdseye, the inventor of the fast freezing of, of foods, addressed himself to that question. That, that was the mammoth that was found in 1906, I believe it was. Um, you know, fully, fully intact, uh, frozen out of the permafrost. There had been a warm, a warm year. You know, we'd had a, a warming. You know, the global warming began in the mid-19th century. Let's be clear, clear on that. It, it began 100 years before we were dumping significant amounts of fossil fuels into the atmosphere. It terminated what basically is known by climatologists as the Little Ice Age, which was the coldest three or 400-year period since the end of the Big Ice Age, right? Well, as a consequence of this warming, there was melting of permafrost throughout Siberia. And in the early 1900s, one of, there was a cliff face that collapsed and exposed this, this frozen mammoth. And I think it was probably two seasons before scientists actually got there to the site and were able to study the remains of the mammoth. But, yeah, I mean, there was undigested food in its stomach. Now, <clears throat> what Clarence Birdseye did was he addressed himself to the question of, of how much heat would be retained by a, a mammoth carcass. And it's pretty interesting what he came up with. Um, he concluded that... Um, and I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, right. um, but it was something along these lines, um, that the uh, the carcass had to have been frozen completely through and through within, I believe, the, the number he came up with was, was less than 12 hours, or the, the contents of the stomach would have begun to putrefy, mm. and, they, and it hadn't putrefied. So, and, and then also based upon an examination of the, the species that the... Um, there was over, I think, around two dozen spe different species of plants that the mammoth had been had been eating. Mammoths were grazers. That is, that they 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 ate basically plants, sedges, and things growing on the ground. Um, and there was like two dozen different species of of plants that this uh, mammoth had been eating, and several of them were flowering. And it and appeared from the species and their their condition of flowering that it would have been that the mammoth met his demise during the um, fall time. But it had to have been warm enough um, at the time the mammoth was eating this, his undigested lunch for there to be flowering plants in Siberia. And, you know, essentially 12 hours later, he's completely frozen through and through, including the contents of his stomach. Right. So as I'm recalling the numbers, um, I could actually pull them up here, but I know we're running out of time um, and get the exact numbers. But essentially, it would have required a, a drop of something like to, on the order of 100 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, basically instantaneously. Wow. Um, and then, of course, the mammoth remained, uh, you know, completely frozen until the day the, the permafrost collapsed and, and revealed them to the to the world. Um but, you know, there have been numerous, there have been dozens of, of these cases of of frozen uh, corpses being found that had apparently been quick frozen. I, my, To me, the most likely explanation is going to be um, extremely cold gases released from the nucleus of a comet mm. entering the Earth's atmosphere, which, because of the fact that they're heavy and dense, are going to rapidly, you know, plunge through the atmosphere and form a dense layer near the Earth's surface. All right, well, let's... And if I, if I had more time, I, you know, I would probably be researching this <laughs> in more detail because it's an extremely fascinating question that has not been resolved yet. But that, that's the direction my research would go. I would be looking at some of these um, you know, volatile gases that we know are contained within the nucleus of, of comets. And, you know, a, basically a comet coming in from space is a an extremely cold, especially the, the dense inner layers of it, the denser inner layers, because um, right. it's basically just a, 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 it's like a frozen mass. And, you know, you've got, you think of carbon dioxide, uh, you know, um, what do you call it, you know, with the real cold, uh, the dry ice, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. carbon dioxide ice. Okay, this is what we're talking about, you know, large amounts of these types of volatile gases uh, entrained within the comet nucleus being suddenly released into the Earth's atmosphere. And these, now because they're so cold, they're now denser than the surrounding um, air, and they would rapidly seek the lowest level, which would be, you know, the level of being occupied by herds of woolly mammoths. But, we, you know, we find that the, the remains of these mammoths 
in such array and disarray that it's clear to me that they succumb to some type of a catastrophe. And when you read the literature, particularly going back to you know the 17, 18, 19, early 1900s, um, you know you repeatedly find these references to these um, expensive, extensive bone deposits being washed up on the shores of the Arctic Ocean, for example. Um, it, it's it's an amazing story. And again, like so many of these things, there's been no real coherent explanation that's come forward that's, you know, there have been attempts to try to dismiss and explain this according to more normal um, events, you know, right. some like a mammoth falling in a sinkhole or, yeah. you know, falling in a frozen river. But really, when you look at those, they just don't hold up under scrutiny. Okay. Um... So... I would I would attribute this to clearly that's one more piece of evidence that that proclaims the fact that there were these tremendous catastrophes that engulfed the planet because you know woolly mammoths I mean they were contiguous over probably three quarters of the Earth's surface and as far as I know there's no woolly mammoths roaming around anywhere on the planet today right. Now, the estimate, some estimates I've seen suggest there may have been as many as six million woolly, woolly mammoths, and that might be conservative because just in 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 um, Africa alone, at the turn of the century, it's estimated that there were around twelve million African elephants, hmm. and there could have been easily that many woolly mammoths worldwide. But you know, there were there were at least five or six species of proboscidean at the end of the last ice age. Um, Two-thirds to three-quarters of those proboscideans succumb to the changes. African elephants and the Indian elephants are the only two species of, of proboscideans that survived. And, you know, you have the subcontinent of India and you have the, uh, the central highlands of eastern Africa, which seems to have been places of refu- refuge um, from the great sweeping catastrophes from which, you know, the great megafauna was able to repopulate. Because bear in mind, North America throughout the course of the Ice Age, had more large species of mammals than you find on the Serengeti Plain of Africa today. Mm -hmm. And Mm. most people don't realize that. I mean, we had three species of elephants living in North America. We had giant camels, you know. I mean, (laughs) the list, there's a huge list of, you know, there were ground sloths the size of modern-day elephants, you know, roaming around. You had saber-toothed cats. You had lions that were, you know... 50% 50% larger in body mass than large modern African lions. You know, you had the giant short-faced bear that could weigh well over a ton. I mean, so you, this, you had this incredible megafauna that inhabited North America, and over three-quarters of the species met a very rapid demise at the end of the last ice age. Likewise with South America. Uh, Europe and Asia lost about a third to half in Africa lost about 10 to 15 percent of its uh, Pleistocene or Ice Age species. Hmm. So it seems that the catastrophes that engulfed the planet spared, you know, the, the central, the lat- you know, the equatorial regions of, of, of Africa. Right. North Africa right. seems to have been hit pretty hard. But, you know, when you get around the area of, of Kenya and, and uh, Tanzania and those areas, the mountains of the moon, the great Rift Valley. I think the Rift Valley itself may have been a, a place of refuge during those great sweeping changes from which, you know, the, the African megafauna was able to repopulate the African continent. But, you know, we lost at least three quarters of, of this megafauna species that inhabited North America. In the case of, like, the North American mastodon, that, there's evidence that the mastodons inhabited North America for two million years, but they disappeared in a geological eye blink, you know, between ten and twelve thousand years ago. And how do you explain that? I don't think you can explain that by any other means than than a catastrophe. You know, the, the standard explanation for the last half century or so is that the woolly mammoths succumbed to overhunting by by human. Uh, Paleo-Indian hunters. But to me, even the slightest bit of scrutiny makes that idea look ridiculous. Because for one thing, I mean, if you look at the anthropological models, you're talking about nomadic tribes, you know, the the Clovis cultures presumably coming across the Bering Land Bridge. Um, 
you know, with with the uh, the melting of the ice and the opening of the ice free corridor, which would have occurred, you know, between eleven and twelve thousand years ago, somehow being able to sweep down and and exterminate, you know, seventy five to hundred species of megafauna from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego, and and exterminating six or eight million woolly mammoths when the whole population of the planet is only a fraction of that. I mean, it just doesn't make sense to attribute the extinction of the great megafauna to, to human predation. And yet, that has been the dominant theory for, for you know, half a century. Well, not only that, don't they, and, don't they say, don't, don't we have proof now that man has been on North American continent longer than that? Yeah, well, it's controversial, but I think the evidence in hand shows that humans have been around here at least 25 or 30,000 years. But again, we, we run into that same problem, is that once you begin to realize the geomorphic, geological, and environmental changes and how extreme they have been, in my mind, as I've become familiar, you know, and traversed literally tens of thousands of miles of landscape studying these geomorphic changes, the, the question that comes in my mind is, hmm, what I'm surprised is, is how could humans have even survived at all? How did humans not go the way of the woolly mammoths? But right. we survived somehow. But I can certainly see how human societies would have succumbed to these changes. And, and this gets us to a, a really interesting question. When we begin to look at the very dawn of recorded history, we see things that just are so out of context that I, it, it's a wonder to me that these conventional models of history and prehistory have not succumbed to, to these inconsistencies. You look at the very beginning of recorded history, and what do we see? We see monumental architecture. Egypt is a prime example. Presumably you had a subsistence agricultural, you know, subsistence agriculture being practiced along the Nile River Valley for, you know, centuries and centuries. And then within, what, a generation or two, they're building these gigantic pyramids. Right. It, it makes no sense, and we see that same phenomenon all over the planet at the same time, whether it was ancient Babylonia, whether we see the, the sudden appearance of megalithic culture in the British Isles, whether we see the sudden appearance of the Indus Valley civilization, you know, along the Indus River between India and Pakistan, it's the same scenario. It's like for, for hundreds, if not thousands of years, not much is going on. And then all of a sudden, in, in a generation or two, you see all of this tremendous activity. Well. <clears throat> when you look at the history of the Holocene, it's clear now that, you know, around 5,000 years ago, there was a series of catastrophes. You know, it's likely that a bolide or an asteroid fell into the Indian Ocean 5,000 years ago and probably wiped out any civilization, incipient civilization around the coastlines of the Indian Ocean. Mm. Um, we could get into a long discussion of that because it's extremely interesting, but... Um, you know, we're probably not going to have time for that. <laughs> yeah, but, I think you know, we're going to have to postpone that one. Yeah, we're going to have to probably, you know, write some books, have some more conversations about these things. Um, you know, the, of course, we're just talking here words. You know, what what really, what I tell people, you know, it's the old cliche that a, a, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? So we could talk several thousand words. I could show people a few pictures of, of things and say, yeah, here, here's... Take a, take a new look at this mountain range. Take a new look at this canyon. And here's why this canyon could not have been created slowly over millions of years. Here's why it had to have been created in a geological instance. And then I go further then. I say, and if a picture, if a picture is worth a thousand words, actually getting out and traversing these landscapes is worth a thousand pictures. Because people have traversed these landscapes for years now without knowing what they're looking at. And I think we're now on the verge of a major paradigm shift. And this is one of the things that we're trying to do and accomplish with our work, is to give people the eyes to take a new look at the world around them and realize that we have built this emerging global civilization out of the wreckage of multiple former worlds. And literally, we're living in that wreckage. And we don't know how to recognize that wreckage because it's on such a vast scale, it's beyond our ability to perceive. But now, with the advent of, of you know, uh, Google Earth and satellite photography and, and, you know, 
the things that the technologies that we're evolving, um, we can look at the planet with new eyes, and we can realize that there is a message etched into the surface, the whole surface of our planet. And it's ten or 12,000 years old, and it's been there waiting ten or 12,000 years for humans to evolve the intellectual capacity and the eyes, the eyes to see it and the intellectual capacity to understand what they're looking at. And I think we're right now on the cusp of this major transition where we're going to suddenly realize that the history of the human species on planet Earth is far deeper, far stranger than anybody had ever even begun to imagine. And there's a whole lot more to it. And that basically we're just infants when it comes to understanding the real story of our species on this planet. All right. I, I did have one listener question for you. Jack wanted to know the, if you had any ideas about the actual period periodicity of the catap- catastrophic events that hit the Earth. <clears throat> yes. That's a very good question, Jeff. Um, one of the things that has very much interested me is the periodicity. And I think it's clear from from sacred traditions that also look at this. We can turn to the Vedas. We can turn to the Babylonian myths. We can turn to biblical accounts. Um, we can turn to the astronomical accounts, the geological record. And I think they're all converging upon this um, vindication of this ancient model of the great year, what we refer to as the great year, right. which, you know, I mentioned that it seems like the onset of the last great, the last phase of the great ice age, which by glaciologists and climatologists is called the late Wisconsin, began around twenty six to 28,000 years ago. Well, it seems that there is a tempo that's roughly based on a 26,000-year cycle. We see that the last phase of the Australian megafaunal extinctions are dated to about 26,000 years ago. We're seeing that the, probably the final appearance of Neanderthal is dating to about 26, 27,000 years ago. We can go back in 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 history, and I have assembled, this would be something actually we should be posting on our website, um, I've assembled a timeline that goes back 200,000 years, because what I've attempted to do is show what we now know about documented environmental changes to planet Earth during the time that modern humans have been here. And what we come up with is that there are at least a dozen events that have tra- that have occurred, that have transpired in the last 150 to 200,000 years, that were at such a level of of extremity that were they to occur today, most likely our global civilization would collapse and perhaps require centuries to recover, if if it could even recover. Um, And this has happened again, I'm proposing at least a dozen times since humans have been here. Now, one of the things that I have um, been very much interested in is Jeff's question about periodicity. It was, I think it, it was Jack. Oh, Jack. Sorry, Jack. Um, what Jack's um, question. Um, it appears to me that there is a, a, um, a tempo that seems to be based around 26,000 years because we can find major events at, at 52,000 years. We can find a major, major event happening at about 104,000 years ago. We see that um, the last phase of the Great Ice Age began around 26,000 years ago. It ended around 13,000 years ago, which is a half cycle. And we can, again, we're getting this, this gets complicated, and we can look at how it, how it um, is a subset of some of these greater epochs, such as described in the, um, the Vedas. If, if Jack is familiar with the Vedas, I would recommend that as a... Um, as a, a, a source of, of research, looking into the, the span of time called the Yugas and the Kalpas. And what we see, for example, is that the, the Treta Yuga is 1,296,000 years, and that happens to be essentially 1,000 times, or rather 100 times, the, the, the half cycle. Um, it's 50 processional cycles, and the procession of the equinox which carries us through the 12 astrological ages, which are sometimes referred to as platonic months, um, seems to be linked in with this tempo. You know, everybody's familiar, you know, from pop culture cliches about 
the age of Pisces and shifting into the age of Aquarius. But what does that actually mean in the astronomical sense? Well, it's the position of the equinoxes, in this case the vernal equinox, transiting through the 12 signs of the zodiac. That that full cycle of transiting uh, vernal equinox takes 26,000 years, in give or take a century or two. Well, if we go back 13,000 years ago, the, uh, the vernal equinox was transiting out of the constellation of Virgo into the constellation of Leo. And that seems to be when the, the curtain really came down on the former world age, and we find the first real major catastrophic event bringing the planet out of the Pleistocene Ice Age, going into the Holocene, which is the current modern, um, you know, the, the, the modern geological epoch, really began right at around 13,000 years ago, as the vernal equinox was transiting into the, the age of Leo. I mentioned that there was apparently a catastrophe between five and 6,000 years ago that um, may have wiped out any civilizations around the Indian Ocean and probably was responsible for the legends of, of Noah's Flood and uh, the Flood of Zisithris or the Flood of Utnapishtim and some of these various culture heroes that survived these great floods. Mm. It now does appear from geomorphic evidence that there really was extreme flooding uh, around the, the, the shores of the Indian Ocean between five and 6,000 years ago, during which time the vernal equinox was transiting through the age of Taurus. Now, one of the models that we've inherited from, uh, you know, sacred traditions is this fourfold division of the, the cycle of time symbolized in the form of the four fixed signs of the zodiac. Leo the lion, Taurus the bull, uh, the eagle representing Scorpio, and uh, the angel or the man representing the age of Aquarius. And <clears throat> what's interesting is that if we look back, we find evidence that as the vernal equinox, and this is purely just empirical evidence, we don't have a theoretical explanation for this yet, but empirical evidence would suggest that it seems that on these, you know, quarter periods of the cycle, things happen. Hmm. Um, and it seems like we, we go through these periods of general quiescence, and then we get to one of these cosmic intersections, and for a short period of time, for a few centuries, that's where all the action is concentrated. And what I'm, what I, if I was going to develop any kind of a theory around this, it would be simply that we're seeing some type of period, uh, periodical or, or change in the cosmic environment. And we're seeing those changes reflected down here on the, below on the surface of the Earth. Right. And those changes could, I think, be explained by uh, a, a, a periodic or cyclical influx of comets into the inner solar system. And those comets, as we now realize, are extremely exotic, complicated animals. And when they come into the inner solar system releasing their cosmic cargo, it can trigger all kinds of changes um, in the biological realm, in the geological realm, in the hydrological realm, in climate, the whole array of, of changes that we would, could experience down here below can be affected by the incursion of, of cometary uh, material. Uh, including, you know, the breaking up of comets and forming swarms of asteroids. Right. Um, we now know that these comets are extremely variable in their composition and makeup. They have extraordinarily exotic uh, cargoes that they carry and trained within their frozen masses. And if Earth encounters either directly a comet nucleus or the byproducts of a disintegrating comet, it can have extraordinary consequences. And again, this could be a subject matter for a whole nother hour of discussion <laughs> yeah I'm but this is what i would suggest that jack take a look in that direction and and you know i'm going to be trying to put more and more information online that can help anybody who's interested in these kind of questions and doing further deeper research to put them on to you know new insights you know re relevant research that's going on and so forth because i believe this is so important for us to understand getting a, tr a true sense of our own history in order to have any hope for a successful future. Yes, I agree completely. And, and also to try to get people to shift from, you know, people are wallowing, basically, to me, they're just wallowing in this surfeit of trivia and superficiality and, and you know, pop culture and things that has just become so distracting through mainstream media that has no 
really long range consequences. You know, when at the same time there are these just profound earth shaking discoveries being made, you know, hey, like we opened the conversation about the pyramid off the, the coast of the Azores. Yeah. Right there, if that proves to be authentic, I mean, that's a major um, glitch within the orthodox theories about prehistory. And you know, I'll say again, if 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 we want to have a future history on this planet, we have to understand where we've come from and the, an authentic history of our own species on this planet. I agree. Which I, I don't think agree. we've got through through conventional sources yet. No. Uh, we're just about out of time. Real quick, your website that people can find stuff on, you have sacredgeometryinternational.com. And what what's the other one? Well, Cosmographic Research. Where you know that I haven't put anything new up there for a couple okay. of years, but it still provides a good introduction to a lot of the stuff we're talking about. I mean, there's probably a dozen articles up there with references and so forth that, that somebody like Jack could could go and check out. And then you know, if they're interested, I can give you my email because anybody who's interested in this, I'm more than happy to share information and research with them. And I'm always looking for people who want to participate. Uh, actively, you know, in doing field research, helping out with expeditions, helping getting this information out there. I'm always looking to recruit people to go out into the field and actually, like I was saying earlier, you know, um, there's nothing like the experience of going in the field and seeing and experiencing these landscapes for yourself and learning to read this this language of the landscape um, and, and learning to read this this story this like i say it's been etched into the surface of the earth and waiting ten thousand years for us to learn how to read it yeah so i i could give you my email it's randall r-a-n-d-a-l-l dot carlson c-a-r-l-s-o-n at gmail.com and i may not have time to reply right away um but, you know, feel free to email me or email the Sacred Geometry website, and it'll eventually get to me. And Cameron does an excellent job of responding to people um, when I get overwhelmed. Um, like I said, you know, when we started this conversation, my, my design and build business just went, has gone crazy in the last three months. And right. so, which is a good thing, because yes. I'm, I've, I've got a real income again. But at <laughs> the same time, it, it, you know, what is it? I have the time to do research. And no money, or I have money and no time to do research. So it's <laughs> and people can sign up for your classes at sacredinternational.com. dot uh, com. Sacred Geometry International. Yes. yes. Sorry about that. Sacred Geometry. <laughs> <laughs> and you got a fundraiser going on that. And there's also a rumor you're going to be uh, mentioned in Graham Hancock's new uh, new book. Yes, this is the rumor that's going around. I hope it's the case. You know, he's expressed an interest. I mean, I've met Graham. I was the. Um, I was the featured author on his website last December, and he's going to be here. Uh, when is he going to be here? Spring 2014. Spring of 2014, uh, and he wrote us a nice email saying he was very interested in actually going out in the field with me, so I could, you know, take him through these landscapes, and so he could see them for himself. Awesome. Because you know Graham has been one of the people that's been way ahead of the curve on this. I mean. Way back in 1996, he was onto the idea that Earth had encountered uh, cosmic debris and that the Ice Age may have been started and terminated by Earth's encounter with, with these cosmic entities, when no, essentially nobody else was. I mean, I was, this was an idea I came up with in the 80s, simply because as I was becoming more and more familiar with these changes, I became convinced that there were no ter terrestrial mechanisms capable of the job. There was nobody else out there talking about this virtually, hardly anyone at all, a few, a few, a handful. But Graham was like the first major author putting out, you know, best-selling books right. where he was, pr pr uh, you know, proposing this idea, I think, as early as 1996. And I'm sure he'd had to actually come across the same conclusion that I did much earlier than 1996. But I remember in Fingerprints of the Gods and the Mars Mystery, both, he, he talked about the very idea I was expressing here, uh, that perhaps, you know, the Earth encountered the uh, material of a disintegrating comet, and that's what could have caused the catastrophic melting. Now, what I've done is I've gone and identified what I believe are the geomorphic imprints 
of where debris would have actually in, impacted the ice sheet. And so hopefully what I'm going to do is take guide Graham as he does research for um, his his uh, sequel to Fingerprints of the Gods to show him, yeah, here's the, here's the geological evidence, Graham, that completely supports what you were saying 20 years ago. Yeah. And it does. So, yeah, Graham, Graham you know, he, he, he suffered a lot of flack from conventional from academia and the or- defenders of orthodoxy, and you know when you do when you're doing what Graham does, or any of us who are in these you know fringe researchers, you gather so much information and you're 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 exploring so many ideas. So yeah, of course, sometimes you're going to put ideas out there and information that may be may be wrong, but it, it doesn't discredit your the entire paradigm that you, you know the, the the whole paradigm shift. And you know I've seen just sl- almost slanderous um, you know critiques of his work where they completely miss the point yeah. or they hone in on some some fact that he may have had wrong that really has no bearing on the larger picture that he's presenting at all but i'm i'm really uh it's gratifying to me that he's he's going forward now with a sequel to fingerprints because he's been one of the the, the preeminent exponents of of trying to get people to to reconsider our history on this planet yeah and so he certainly gets earns my respect for that all right. Well, thank you very much, Randall. Hopefully we can have you on again soon because there's still so much I want to talk to you about. We never got to Freemason 3 or Wilhelm Reich, but maybe next time we can delve into that a little bit. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah, because I've got some good stuff on there. Um, you know, I tie in the, the Reichian stuff with the Holy Grail legends, and it's extremely interesting. So that awesome. would be a, an interesting conversation. So let's do it. All right. So we'll talk again soon. Last Exit for the Loss is up next, taking you out with some Psyche Corporation, talking about the mathematics of the universe. See you next week. <laughs>